Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, welcome to the week four of um, thermoelectricity from atoms to systems. Uh, this week, we are looking at some of the system requirements for. Um, conversion of heat into electricity, um, uh, as for energy generation, as well as for cooling. Um, and uh, we look at uh, how thermoelectric devices are used. Um, uh, in the introductory lecture, we already discussed that if we look at our energy use in the world, uh, out of the 15 terawatts um, that is provided through the fossil sources, uh, biomass, uh, nuclear, as well as renewables, um, to make it to work, we convert it using energy conversion devices, internal combustion engine, burners, as well as power plants for electricity. A big problem is 90% of the primary energy is first converted to heat uh, before it's converted to useful work. And out of these, only 12% goes to the uh, useful amount of work by exergy. Um, and so there is a huge challenge or potential to get this 88% of the energy that is uh, not uh, used uh, 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 to do work. Uh, and thermoelectrics have a potential um, to have an impact. So where are the areas where thermoelectrics could have a big impact? We can look at it if you look at energy flow in our society. This is the graph that again was shown in the uh, introductory uh, lecture. Um, that shows for the case of US, so that uh, consume about one fourth of the world energy, about 3.3 terawatts. Um, again, similar percentage of the energy come from the fossil fuels. Uh, but if you look at the end use, we have a large portion, 58%, which is wasted. The two main waste are in power plants, according to um, uh, the estimates from uh, uh, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, the overall efficiency of our, all of our power plants is about 32%. Um, in transportation, the overall efficiency is about 25%. So these are the two big areas with a lot of heat is generated and we don't do anything useful with it. Uh, the question is um, um, how we can use this heat. Uh, let's take both of these cases. Let's start with cars. In, um, in a car, the chemical energy in the fuel is burned. Um, about uh, one third of the energy is lost through the exhaust, through the heating that happens in the catalytic converter, heat up to um, 500 uh, degrees Celsius or so. And another um, third of the energy is lost through the cooling system in the engine that heats up maybe 2000 degrees, um, about 5% friction loss, and the rest is moving the car. So the question is, uh, the two-thirds that is going either through the exhaust or through the engine, we can do, can we do something useful with it? The engine has higher temperatures, but also is much more crowded. Uh, it's harder to get into. Um, so most of the work for thermoelectric has been concentrated in the area of the catalytic converter and the exhaust to see if we can take some of the power out. Um, the key challenge here is um, the exhaust temperature varies a lot with the acceleration and the rate of uh, burning the fuel. So it's a very transient heat source. And um, that um, has some complications in terms of uh, using that efficiently with a thermoelectric device. The other application uh, is in a power plant. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is uh, realistic simulations of temperature profile in a realistic supercritical steam turbine coal fire plant, uh, about 502 megawatt electrical capacity, um, and efficiency is on the order of 40 to 42 uh, percent. You can see the size of this is about 165 feet um, in the main uh, boiler uh, section here. So the systems or the power plants we have today take the heat from the combustion and from the ambient, and they run a high-performance uh, supercritical ranking cycle, where the temperature of the working fluid is on the order of 800 Kelvin. So 
this is the temperature range between 800 Kelvin and the ambient where we do the work and we produce the work. There is significant exergy and ability to do work um, uh, is lost between the flame temperature and the working fluid. An idea is to put the thermoelectrics at the topping cycle and um, this efficiency of this adds up to the existing and that's a potential where uh, power plant efficiency could increase using thermoelectrics. And we will discuss later in the week about the specific designs of thermoelectrics and how we can make, um, uh, we can implement it in uh, such a configuration. Um, whenever we talk about conversion of heat into electricity, uh, we have to be aware what are the power conversion efficiencies. Uh, here is the gener fraction or power generation efficiency versus hot side temperature, assuming the cold side is ambient uh, uh, 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, the black curve on top is the Carnot factor, which is just basically 1 minus temperature on the cold side divided by temperature on the hot side. This is the factor that is the ultimate efficiency of any thermal engine. Um, the solid lines here you can see is the efficiency of a thermoelectric uh, if z times t, the dimensionless figure of merit, is 0.5 or 2 or 4 and up to 20. And we can see that today's thermoelectric with z times t average about 0.5 or so have efficiencies below 10%. Um, and if z times t could become 4, we can get efficiencies between 10 to 20 percent at low hot side temperature so that this technology could be competitive with organic ranking cycle. But in order to be competitive with the cold ranking and um, nuclear Brighton ranking and so on, we need zts uh, reaching uh, an order of 10 to 20. This is a graph when you look at this um, uh, may, may tell us from where we are to where we could have an impact in the energy uh, crisis, we have a long way to go. Um, in reality, uh, the efficiency alone is not uh, uh, the key factor. We, of course, z times t is important, but we need to look at the whole uh, system um, and see uh, how we can have an impact. Um, uh, there have been a lot of emphasis on Z times T because that's directly related to the deficiency of thermoelectrics. Uh, this is a review paper in 2010 by uh, Chris Venez. Um, you can see from the early times in 1950s where ZT of about uh, one very uh, demonstrated up to year 2000, we didn't see much improvement. Since then, we have reports of ZT of 1.5 to 2. Um, one thing we have to be careful is that some of the record ZTs are not independently verified. In this article, um, authors have tried to pinpoint what have been independently verified and not. That's something we have to be careful. But you see if, uh, today what is the state of the art um, uh, publication in September 2012 is ZT of 2.2 uh, by Mercury Canadzitis group at about 800-900 uh, Kelvin. So this is the state of the art. We are far from um, replacing any of the heat engines that we describe in this graph. Um, so this was actually a um, subject of an article uh, uh, by uh, Croning Wining, one of the uh, early pioneers in thermoelectric work, uh, entitled The Inconvenient uh, Truth About Thermoelectrics. And despite these advances, a thermoelectric energy conversion will never be as efficient um, as the steam engines, that means thermoelectrics will remain limited to applications served poorly or not at all by existing technologies. Bad news for thermoelectricians, but the climate crisis requires that we face the bad news head on. This is a quite a strong statement um, uh, mentioning that because we cannot solve the efficiency or we have not uh, uh, increased the efficiency of thermoelectrics significantly, maybe they should not have a big role in our energy crisis. If you take this article and you replace everywhere thermoelectric with an organic solar cell, the, uh, all of the wording is exactly correct. Organic solar cells uh, will never be as efficient as multi-junction solar cells, at least uh, in the near future. And uh, as a result, they should have a limited impact. We know that this type of uh, argument for organic solar cell will not hold on because people are discussing when we want to build a photovoltaic system, efficiency is only one component. At the end, 
um, what decides what should be implemented is the cost. Um, you, if you look at today's thermoelectrics, um, uh, a graph that is often shown is a graph where it shows how efficiency and cost um, for a PV uh, give rise to dollar per watt. So the vertical axis is the efficiency of the photovoltaic cell, horizontal axis is the dollar per meter squared, the cost of the finished uh, product. Uh, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, we were at the first generation um, photovoltaic with efficiencies less than 20% and costs of a couple of hundred, three to five hundred dollar per meter squared. As a result, we were uh, at the cost of three and a half dollar per watt. Today, we are approaching uh, the cost on the order of one dollar per watt, and this has been done by improving the efficiency a little, but mostly by reducing the cost and coming uh, to a um, cost range of on the order of hundred, two hundred dollar per meter square. In order to go from here to low cost of maybe twenty cents or ten cents per watt. Not only we have to increase the efficiency, but we need to reduce the cost or we need to reduce the cost more aggressively than uh, the, the improvement that we could have in the efficiency. So this trade-off between cost and efficiency is what determines what areas, um, what thermoelectric, uh, what, sorry, photovoltaic devices could be used. Um, uh, but uh, this type of graph um, has been missing in the thermoelectrics, but recently has been um, uh, put out. And in these lectures, we try to point out what are the uh, cost efficiency trade-offs. Um, uh, if we look at the cooling, a uh, similar curve uh, of role of ZT uh, can be uh, drawn. This is coefficient of performance versus temperature difference for cooling. Uh, uh, for a given amount of cooling, let's say uh, 50 degrees or 100 degree cooling, if you, for example, we use a refrigerator um, uh, based on mechanical system, it has a coefficient of performance. Coefficient of performance is the amount of um, um, uh, energy, amount of material that is cooled uh, divided by the amount of work provided. Since it can be more than one uh, people, they don't use 100%. It kind of sounds um, uh, strange, but there is nothing wrong with one watt of uh, energy or power. We can move two, three watts of heat from one location to another and cool down. Um, this is basically the Carnot factor that similarly can be defined. Z times T at low value gives a maximum cooling that can be achieved and also a maximum coefficient of performance. But there is a trade-off. Uh, if we are far from maximum, we can get higher coefficient of performance even with a low ZT number. And this is something that one needs to play if there are applications where we need to cool um, a hot spot only by 10, 15 degrees. Um, we don't necessarily need high ZTs to get high coefficient of performance. Uh, so these are the uh, some of the um, trade-offs. In the area of cooling, really the main uh, commercialization have been for telecom, uh, uh, telecom laser cooling, as well as low noise detector sensor applications. These are cases of packages where thermoelectric cooler is integrated with a device that need to be temperature stabilized or cooled below ambient. Because these devices are very tiny, it doesn't make sense to have a mechanical refrigerator at the size of millimeters. And actually, if you scale it, a mechanical refrigerator to this size, they don't perform as well because of the surface to volume ratios and the fact that the fraction, um, the friction scales with the surface area of um, moving parts. Um, so these tiny thermoelectric coolers are actually a good solution um, today. How we can move forward? About um, uh, 10, uh, 15 years ago, uh, there was uh, thinking that maybe thermoelectric could move in the area of microprocessor cooling. This is a graph from early 2000 that shows power extrapolations for microprocessors from 1970 to uh, 2010, and then extrapolation 2000, uh, to 2000, and then extrapolation until 2010. What is interesting is that in the early 70s, we were dissipating a couple of watts per microprocessor. This went up to uh, six, seven watts in the case of 80, 85, 80, 86 microprocessor. Then actually it went down. This going down because of the technology transition going from bipolar to CMOS. 
but then we put more and more transistor in the microprocessors and we make them faster and this keep going up. So in early 2000, they said by 2010, we should reach 1000 watt per centimeter square power density, which approaches the power density of rocket nozzles and approaching the power density on the surface of the sun. There was huge um, uh, 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 interest in the thermoelectrics if they can solve and remove some of these high power densities. Here are uh, um, data from um, a graph from 2010, 10 years later. Basically, power densities keep going up up to 2002 or so, but then stayed almost constant. How we have been achieved? Uh, the reason they stayed constant is that we couldn't find a good cooling solution cheap enough that could be implemented on each microprocessor. And But how we still achieve progress in the area of microprocessor is instead of making them faster, we put the ones with multiple cores, uh, so that reduce the requirement for uh, cooling. There are still um, discussions that if you take a chip, this is a state-of-the-art chip uh, operating, it could be centimeter squares, could be the, uh, um, uh, dissipating hundreds of watts, but there is regions of the chip that could be 20, 30 degree hotter than the rest of the chip. Um, leakage power exponentially increases with temperature, and lifetime is also exponentially decreased with temperature. With 15 degree temperature rise, the electromigration or oxide breakdown could increase by a factor of four. So typically we make the hottest point on the chip below target value, let's say 85 degrees Celsius. As a result, we need to cool the rest of the chip, uh, even more than what is required to keep the hottest point below the, uh, the threshold values. And this is an area where thermoelectric uh, could have an impact, even if though they, their efficiency is low, they can selectively cool hotspot. And we will have a lecture where we discuss potential for micro refrigeration. Um, and of course, there are applications where temperature non-uniformity affects interconnect delays and crosstalk, and th these are some of the motivations. Let me summarize uh, this lecture. Uh, we discussed that there is a significant fraction of the energy from uh, chemical and nuclear sources that is wasted in the form of heat. Um, uh, the two main areas are waste heat recovery in transportation, in cars and trucks, in internal combustion engine, and um, in power plants. For power plants, putting thermoelectric at the low side um, uh, of the wasted heat, uh, uh, there is some potential, but the economics are harder. Um, uh, we think the area that could have a big impact is in the topping cycle, and we will have a lecture specifically uh, focusing on what are the potentials there. On the cooling side, particular since they can provide localized, high-speed, high-power density cooling, there are applications for active electronic and optolytic devices where their use makes sense, um, especially if we have to go to lower temperature and achieve uh, uh, for sensors. Um, uh, and finally, um, it, through this uh, week four lectures focus on the system, you will see that uh, to look at the full system, you should go beyond just efficiency. One needs to consider the cost, the size, material use, noise, speed of cooling, and so on. Um, so I look forward to see you at lecture uh, number two, where we start the cost and efficiency uh, analysis.